You guys are so kind. Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry, take that. Happy Mother's Day. A lot of good looking moms out there. Wave your hand if you are a mom in this place. Good to see you. You are looking good, right? Hey, I need you to do something before we get started and get into this. You've got your pen and your paper. And if you don't, get out your phone and get uh, take notes because I've got four things you need to write down. Are you ready? You're going to write down the worship list for today because you're going to go back and you're going to listen to that through this week because I will tell you, God has orchestrated this day. Like I'm, I'm bawling all the way through service, all the way through worship going, ah, I don't cry <laughs> because I'm going, if they knew what was coming to them in the word, the worship was so aligned, so aligned. So write these down here in the name of the song, something good, give me faith, king of my heart, and do it again. Go to YouTube, go to Spotify, go to Pandora, go to iTunes, any other music you go listen to. You're going to want to listen to those this week. This is such an honor to be able to minister to you from this platform. I, I just I appreciate Ronnie opening up this. Uh, this is a, an anointed place and that he entrusts me to this today. I just I appreciate that. Um, that he's allowing me to speak to you and what's on my heart. You know, the Lord began to unroll what I've got for you today, April 9th. It's not very long ago, but he began to unroll this thing to me. And then Ronnie said, hey, by the way, you're speaking for Mother's Day. I don't think he actually asked. It was more of a, hey. And I was like, all right, I got this. It's all good. So um, I'm thrilled with with what's going to be today. So the title of today's message, if you are taking notes, It's called Seed of Dreams, Seed of Dreams, Seed of Dreams. How many of you guys are old enough to remember diaries? Anybody, anybody have a diary? Diary, you know, nowadays it's called journaling and you get journals, but you know, back in the day it was called diaries. And I remember when I received my very first diary, I've got a picture of it for you guys, uh, that sweet little, it's tiny. It's about this big. It was uh, January 28th, 1978. Came from TGNY. Yes, it did. It was a gift from my, from my nanny, who is, who is Trisha's mom. And uh, she had brought it. And what she doesn't know is she began to unleash a, a gift in me that would be 40 years of dreaming and hoping and praying through pen and paper. I am such a journaler. How many of you today are, you're pouring out seeds into people's life that are going to open up dreams and hopes and purpose for them? So she did that for me. And uh, (laughs) the sweet little journal, I was so afraid to bring it today. I started to, so I can show you. It's really, it's not that big. And, And the first eight years of these 40 years of pinning are in that journal. It's not that big either. So I took eight years to get through that one. Um, And I started to show you guys the inside cover, you know, where it says this book belongs to and the date, Um, but it had every boy I ever had a crush on all over it. And I went, oh, that, I'm so, I'm like, to read through it, I'm mortified. I'm so embarrassed. So I didn't even bring it because I thought, what if I lay it down (laughs) and somebody sees it? There was nothing in there. It's what teenage drama is made of, you know, it was nothing in there, no spiritual no spiritual, nothing spiritual, just embarrassing, completely embarrassing. But I, I then had a second one. I searched, poor, poor Christian was at my house yesterday in my attic, pulling in boxes, trying to find my second one. I know exactly what it looks like. I know where it is. But the second one was a tad bit more, um, you know, important. It, it kind of took a different, a different step, a, a deeper step, if you will, because I went from writing about that to practicing my last potential name of boys I might marry. Took a big step. I also began to write down possible boy names I'd want for my children or girl names like Brienne or Jade or, or even twin names, you know, just in case. I might have a chance. So I had all of this in 
there. This was important journaling stuff, don't you know? And uh, <laughs> it was just a possibility, but that was years before I was ever to be born, but ever to have babies or ever to start a family. I started to dream, and I started to dream, and I started to dream. And the thing of it was, these were all my plans for me. You know, the vision. have it on the screen is Psalm 139, 13, and 14. And it says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So in 1966, God began creating and knitting and planning. And uh, you know that the scripture, for I know the plans I have for you. God began to pour that in. And it was then he began to orchestrate what was going to become of me. I want to show you this little picture. In 19, uh, June 16, 1967, he drops me on the earth. Boop. And he begins a plan and he begins a purpose. And uh, I want to go back, though. Before that, in 1960, he started knitting and creating. And on January 13th, 1961, God placed this incredible person on the earth. Isn't he so cute? <laughs> He's just so stinking cute. I want to stop right here. I've, I did. I failed to mention Happy Mother's Day to two very important women in my life in this room. My mama, raise your hand, mama, and my mother-in-law, Jerry. They are precious, precious in my, in my life. I'm so thankful for them. I'm thankful my, my stepmom, Trisha, is not here. These women helped to form and create who I am. And I, I just want to give you guys honor. Back to this. I'm so glad. God created and knit him together. And, you know, he was doing all this with me in mind. And I still had six and a half years to go before God placed me on this earth. But he knit Ronnie together with me in mind. And, you know, the thing of it is, is God is a planner. So therefore, we are planners. Before Ronnie, before the girls, I started planning. And it started with the names of what my girls might be. Seven years after I wrote those names in that so important journal, <laughs> he gave me and Ronnie placed in our hands, Tana Breanne Woodward. I know. And as soon as I knew of her presence in my womb, before I even knew what she was, we didn't know what she was going to be. We didn't find out it was that thing. And, and as a matter of fact, when she came out, we knew she was going to be a boy. We just knew it. And she came out. Ronnie goes, he's a girl. What am I going to do with a girl? But we began to pray over her, and we began to plan for her. And then after she was born, that didn't stop my prayers over her. We began to pray her with her every night and did this until she left our house. Pray with her every night. Nine years after I had pinned those names in my journal, God put on this earth and placed on this earth the creation of Victoria Jade. And that little baby, Victoria Jade came into the, into the world and... Um, God blessed us with her. And the same thing, we began to pray and we began to plan over her as well. And, you know, our whole family really came out of a dream of a, a you know, young girl of what might be, of what might be. I began to pray over my girls as a mom and what their futures were going to be. One seed was planted. God created and knitted. He made plans and futures, and he heard my cries and my prayers. And on 2016, we were blessed. God blessed us with two awesome son-in-laws that God dropped into 
as he's creating and knitting them, had Tana and Tori in mind. And what a great thing. I love, I love the story with Tana and Cameron because Tabitha and I had this plan for a long time. Like we had this going on when they were eight, I think. <laughs> so, you know, God works all things out. Even though that was our plan, God saw fit that it would still work. You know, and oh my goodness, I so wanted to show the video of his homecoming today. You know, he didn't, he wasn't there when, when Josie was born. And uh, well, let's just go ahead and move on to the next creation because God has given us this beautiful baby, Josie Brooke. We've got one more. I had two of her, you know, she's, <laughs> and this homecoming and she knows her daddy and grabs his little face in every picture, every video they send us, and they just love each other so much. She knows his, his, his voice, and her daddy is her world, and you can tell it, and it's so awesome. So I'm so honored. God's given me the opportunity to be a mom and now a G-ma, and, and, um, and while this is Mother's Day, and man, we are honored, you guys. We are glad you are here. I believe God's given me a word that each one of us is going to be able to take home today and apply and think through. And uh, I want to start today with a story I found in Genesis. And we're going to start with Genesis 1130. If you're, if you're in your Bibles, we're going to be flipping through Genesis a little bit. Genesis 1130 says this, now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Man, that is a great scripture. Thanks for sharing, right? (laughs) We're going to go on to to chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You know, I love the promises of God. Are you a family today? Are you a family? This is what he says. And in you all, the families of the earth. Does that include you? What, were, what are they going to be? Blessed. Blessed. Claim your blessing today. Know your place. Remind the devil when he comes to attack. You've got this promise. Verse 4, chapter 12, verse 4. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife. Here's the thing is when you think back, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Because what do we know about Sarai? She's barren, but he just gave Abram a promise. So we're going to skip ahead five chapters. We're going to go ahead 25 years and go to chapter 17, verse one. And it says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of the multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And skip ahead to verse 15. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and and she shall become nations. King of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face, and he laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Here's the thing. God's making a promise for the impossible. Abraham is virtually 100 years old and Sarah is 90. And even in those days where their life was longer, it was, uh, we are having mic problems today. Fruit basket mic over. Okay. Even in those days, uh, you know, this is going to be impossible. It's not just unusual. It was going to be impossible. And Abraham said to God, verse 18, Oh, that Ishmael might live 
before you. Ishmael was a son he had with a servant named Hagar. We can get to that here in a little bit. And God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But... I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time. So we're going to get into all this. I know it's a lot of scripture, but it's, it's powerful. It's powerful. So how many of you guys, like maybe even last night, had the weirdest dream? Anybody have a weird dream? Like, have you ever had one of those dreams where you wake up and you think, you, you just can't shake it, and it's super vivid? And you go, that was bizarre, or that was from the Lord, or whatever. Or maybe, maybe you've, you've got a great idea that's been dropped into your spirit. A plan even, a thought of something for you to, to do. Maybe it's a calling. God has placed into your heart, and he's begun to cultivate it there. And, you know, make, make something happen of it. What do you usually do whenever that happens? I think about it, but usually I run to Ronnie. I had the weirdest dream last night, and he's like, oh, my gosh, you and your dreams. No, <laughs> real, really, typically that's how it goes. Typically I'll run and I'll tell Ronnie what God's been dropping on my heart. I think that's what we do a lot of times. Um, In chapter 12 of Genesis, God gives Abraham a promise. He will be a great nation. He said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And you, through you, all families will be blessed on the earth. And he was 75 years old. When you go back to chapter 11, remember, Sarah was barren. But I think when God dropped this in Abraham's heart, I can only imagine He told Sarah the plans God had given him. And at 75 and 65, this really wasn't too much of a stretch. Unusual because they were older, but not impossible. When you look at Abraham and the lineage of Abraham, it was not unusual for them to live 150, 200 years old. I cannot even imagine that now, but 150, 200 years old. So 75, you know, 65 for her, it's like the new 40, right? It's not unusual to have a baby at 40 nowadays. So for her, this was not impossible at that time, just unusual. And I believe, I kind of wonder with her, had she already started a diary of names? You know, had she already began to imagine what this was going to be like? Had she already began to plan out these things? And then when they got the promise from God, she knew, I'm sure she knew in her heart, all right, I may be 65, but here we go. We're going to, this is going to happen for me. What are those things that have been planted into your heart? What are your dreams? What is your calling? You know, the thing it is, is when the seed is planted, there's conception. And you'll go through a season of pregnancy. You'll go through a season of pregnancy. And it's in that time, that's where there's time for growth and development and preparing for your dream to become a reality. And even though Sarah wasn't pregnant, she began to enter into a season of pregnancy, if you will that pregnancy of expectation. And I think so many times we find ourselves in seasons of pregnancy. What do you do during those times? So number one, if you're taking notes, here's what happens in those seasons. Number one, you know it's there, but nobody else sees it. You know it's there, but nobody else sees it. I can remember Tana being pregnant with Josie. And she was getting so frustrated at eight and nine months because Josie didn't become a round little ball out here. She, she, I don't know where she was hiding. (laughs) And Tana was like, that's not fair. I don't look pregnant. I remember when we first found out, you know, you wait for those two pink little lines to show up. You don't know you're pregnant. You know what I'm saying? You don't feel it, but those little lines and the doctor tell you it's there. 
God has placed something in your heart and it's there, but nobody else can see it. I couldn't wait to buy uh, maternity clothes. Couldn't wait. Couldn't wait for it. I didn't need them, (laughs) but I wore them. (laughs) You know, nobody else could see it, but I knew it was there. And I think there are times when God's placed something in your heart, a dream, a purpose, something for your family, something he's working on, and you know it's there and nobody else can see it. What do you do? You put it on anyway. You act in it anyway because you know God's promises. You know what he's given to you. I I really think about, (laughs) I think about Josie. She, Tana didn't look ready. She wasn't great big and pregnant. And they're out. They went to eat, I think, and we're walking down the sidewalk. And all of a sudden, she's like, she's with Ronnie, which this to me, if I could have had video of this, my heart would be so happy. Because she was like, Dad. And he's like, what? She goes, either my water just broke or I just wet my pants. And I can just see him like, oh, you know, all panicked. And what do we do? Where do we go? He probably handled it actually probably better than I would have. I'm the one who panics. And so, um, you know, Josie came. The thing of it is, is she came early. We weren't expecting it. God's timing is perfect in whatever he's doing in your life. And it may be 25 years from now, or it may be tomorrow, and you were not expecting it. You just have to be expecting. Does that make sense? You have to be expecting. Here's something I told our worship team last week. We, we see this. You know, our worship team, I want y'all to stand up if you're in here. Y'all stand up. Y'all stand up. What you don't see... What you don't see in each and every one of these guys is God has dropped into them the calling of worship, the calling of leading, and the calling of doing this thing day, week in, week out. And their heart, their heart is not that they make it perfect up here, but it flows out here. And we develop worshipers out here and that you become engaged in the worship of God because they just, they want that honor to go to him so badly that even when they don't see it, they do it anyway. They do it anyway. And they prove they not even the performance, but the action of it closing their eyes and they're going to give it all they have because they know, number one, it's not because of them. It is because of God and what he's placed in them. But he, they also know that when his anointing is there and it goes above our abilities, then we're going to know it's God. Y'all have a seat. Thank you so much. The thing of it is, is it's like being pregnant when no one notices. You do what you do because it's a calling. You do what you do when no one is looking and no one is recognizing. And you do it because the seed's been planted. You do it because you know it's there even when no one sees it. Number two. Season of pregnancy can feel like death. (laughs) While this is not true for all people, for me, pregnancy was not my favorite thing. Not not one bit. We are uh, late winter, early spring of 1992. We are coming back from a youth trip to Red River, and we hit Cimarron Canyon. How many of you have been through Cimarron Canyon? Yes. Um, I'm in the people mover. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I don't feel so good. As a matter of fact, I don't feel real good at all. So we find a, somehow in there, find a a rest stop, pull over. And the thing of it is, is morning sickness hit me like a flood. And it was ugly. And it was heard by all as it echoed off the canyon walls. (laughs) You know, (laughs) it felt like forever before I could eat normal again. It felt like forever. And there were changes in my body and I was so tired. And you know, the thing of it was, is the excitement Ronnie had, you know, those two little lines that you see and you're like, yes, we're going to have a baby. You don't know what's coming. (laughs) 
Ronnie's so excited. I'm going to be a dad until about the eighth month. And he is sick and tired of rolling out my back because it's, and so, you know, I'm hurting and he's having to do all that. And he is sick and tired of having to do that. Although he did it without complaining. He's so good. Um, then there's the process of birth. Okay. Tana did not want to come out. She was stubborn then. <laughs> she's my oldest child and she's a leader. <laughs> She was stubborn there. She for two days, this girl hung out in there. And, and Ronnie is so sweet. When they finally we went to delivery, I mean, Ronnie is like, he pushed as hard as I did. We would push, and then we would all three, me, the nurse, and the other person that was in there, I don't remember at this time, we'd all look up at him and say, are you okay? Oh, it was the doctor. Me, the nurse, the doctor. Are you okay? And he was like, yeah, I'm fine. You know? <laughs> the process felt like death. You know, this was all my dream. I had journaled it. I had prayed. God had dropped it in there. And he'd given me this. But in that moment, you know, not everything was sweet and lovely. And then she was born, and I experienced sleep deprivation. And she pooed, and she spit up, and she cried, and she cried, and she, and Tori loved Barney. I hate Barney. You know, <laughs> it feels like death. There are sometimes it just can feel like death. The thing of it is, is I didn't see that part of my dream. That wasn't in my plan. That wasn't pretty. And, you know, I didn't imagine as they grew, they might possibly break my heart at moments. And I would be crying my heart out. That wasn't in my pretty little plan. And I didn't see the part where I'd get so frustrated at them. I want to kill them until God they died. You know, that wasn't part of the pretty little plan I had. And there were moments, teenage years, let me hear it from my parents that are teenagers, bless you, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord make his grace shine upon you and be gracious to you. I'm telling you, teenage years, I thought I was going to kill some girls. But you know, God is faithful. And that, that growing and that death walk of that dream, God moved and they are amazing women that love the Lord. They're amazing. I just didn't give up on that dream. There are times that our dreams feel like death or even that they have died. Maybe they feel like they're without life. But you know, a seed, when you plant it, has to die. It has potential life. It has potential life, but it has to go into the ground, be covered with dirt, Go into darkness and die before life can spring up out of it. And God has planted a dream, a seed inside of you for something in your life. Each one of us, it's different. For some, it may be just your family. Right now, it may be your career or your calling. Whatever it is, whatever place you're in, if you're going through the death and dying time, it's not the time to give up. This is the time God's cultivating and moving. Sarah waited 25 years so many times because we're having to wait that's when we abort our pregnancy because we can't see anything happening and this is not the time to throw it aside if you know God has spoken it to you you know what it's not the time to walk away because you're not perfect do you know Abraham as they're traveling and moving twice, not once, but twice, he tried to get rid of Sarah. Not tried to, but she was beautiful. And so he was afraid they were going to kill him for her. So he, he offered her up in a sense. Not once, but twice. So they were not perfect in this seed planting God had done for them. You see what I'm saying? They were not perfect. But God still worked through that. I think even in Sarah, you talk about not perfect. She understood the promise that was offered to Abraham. She understood what was offered as far as like this was the promise he would have. He'd be the father of many nations. And since she wasn't able to give a child, she offered her servant Hagar and gave, you know, with Abraham, they had Ishmael. That wasn't God's plan at all. She kind of messed up there. 
She gave up. She, I am a fixer. How many fixers do we have in the house? I am such a fixer. I am a fixer. And at age 14, God called me to full-time ministry at youth camp. Full-time. When I started dating uh, Ronnie, my dad was like, well, he's not a minister. He worked at Pantex. He's not a ministry. This isn't your calling. And I, but I knew that I knew. And we got married. And uh, after seven years, he went full-time into ministry. There we were. Up until then, I'd been a stay-at-home mom. I'd been able to stay with my girls. And the ministry we did, we did Canyon. We were youth pastors. I would go up and do all the work. I mean, life was awesome. It was my calling. But sometimes there's death in your callings so that you can have greater things. And what we found is a trip to the actual desert of Arizona where I had to start working full time. And I even, when we finally got back to this area, told Ronnie, I said, we will never go anywhere again. I went back to school. I helped God out. (laughs) Got my degree. I started teaching and I've been doing this for 14 years. But every single time it's been like, I'm supposed to be in what? Full-time ministry. And I know God is faithful. And he brought us to this church. This really was our ultimate calling, and God's doing an amazing work here. We are blessed by this family. So very blessed. But sometimes your idea of what your picture, perfect dream looks like, isn't what is what is actually happening. Okay? Maybe you're in the right place, but there's no recognition that you even exist. Maybe that dream job you landed, now your boss is down your throat, and you can't get along with the people around you, and you can't do anything right. And you're wondering, what in the world? Maybe about the time your dream is right there, your finances go flying out the window. Maybe... Nothing is happening just like you pictured it. If you look at Ecclesiastes 5, 3, it says, For a dream comes with much busyness and painful effort. Much busyness and painful effort. Don't abort that dream. Don't abort that dream. God plants seeds and dreams in people, but when they find out how much effort it will take, If they decide this is going to take too long, so many times they abort it. You don't know what God has in store. You have to die to self. You have to trust God through the process. Number three, you don't see what God sees. There is a big picture dream. You don't see what God sees. There is a big picture dream. I want to go back to Genesis 17, 15. And read this again. It said, God said to Abraham, for your wife, Sarai, your, for, as, your, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her. And moreover, I will give, her, give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. If you skip ahead to Genesis 18, verse 9. Visitors have come in, and they're talking to Abraham, and they say to Abraham, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Ninety and one hundred. And now it's impossible because Sarah really is old. Like, it's impossible. She physically is not able to produce children. It's an impossible thing. But I want to show you something. Something Sarah, <laughs> something Sarah did not know. And I want to I read this to you. It says, when sin entered the world, man's future became dark and full of despair. And God gave a ray of hope. And if you go back all the way to Genesis 3.15, he said, I will put enmity between enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and, sh- and you shall bruise his heel. And by tracing God's promise through the Bible, we gain a clearer picture of his love and his provision he made for us through his son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Here's the thing is God's promise of Jesus was dealt with the seed of women and the bruising of the devil's head. It would be more than 4,000 years before the arrival of the promised seed of a woman. What made the one who was the fulfillment of the promise so special is for one thing, he was born apart from the natural process. Man was not included in the birth of Jesus. He was the seed of a woman. And to trace that seed, it goes back to Abraham. And the promise in Genesis 12, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in, all, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But what we have to remember is that seed, yes, it was coming from Abraham, but it was to be born of a barren woman named Sarah. I don't know if you are getting this but my heart, I'm like going, I, I just want to go tell Ronnie. <laughs> I want to go tell Ronnie what I just read. I want you to understand your salvation. You're sitting in this room because Sarah was barren and God made a promise and he picked her. And she had to wait 25 years before it came to pass. And he chose her and made an impossible thing that her seed planted would be the lineage of Jesus. You don't know what God has placed in your heart. And it may be taken 14, 15, 20, 30 years, but you have no idea the salvations that might fall behind it. You have no idea that son, that daughter, that person that maybe you don't see they are living for Christ now, don't give up on them. You have no idea what God has in store if you're faithful. Sarah was in the plan for bringing salvation to the entire world through the bloodline and birth of Jesus. God placed a full-time calling, a calling of full-time ministry on my heart at 14 for a purpose and a reason. There's a bigger picture. There's a reason why today, May of 19, 2019, that I am standing here delivering this word so you can hear it. You're in this room. You're watching on Facebook. There's a reason and a purpose. He knit together. He planned. He created. He has that in mind for each and every one of us in this room. You may be pregnant with something you've never seen. Sarah had never seen a 90-year-old have a baby. She'd never seen it. And maybe God's placed something in your heart. Maybe your family has never gotten out of poverty. And maybe, just maybe, you're pregnant with faith for healing in your body when the odds are against it. Maybe, just maybe, you're pregnant with the success of a new business and you know this is it. This is it. Maybe you have a dream of success through the talent God has given you. For today, God knew you would be here. And he knew that you would understand he has a plan. He has a purpose. That dream you've cast off. That dream you were given years ago. That calling that has just been sitting there. God still sees it. God still sees it. Don't ever give up. Don't ever start, stop praying. I know Mother's Day, such a joy for so many of us. And for others, it can be heartbreaking with the loss of a child or even a loss of a mom. And if you're in that place, to, in that place today, because I know it happens holidays like this can be a dread for some. They just dread it, especially if it's something recent. But I want to tell you something. Remember the whole point of the seed sometimes goes through death. God works all things out for good that love him that are called according to his purpose. And right now, this is not good. And we can't understand the ways of God. We can't even understand what the enemy will do come still to kill, still and destroy but whatever the enemy has done, God will pick up and make a good thing out of it. And maybe you're in financial ruin right now. You can't even understand why God will pick up and make new. 
pick up and make new. We have to understand these things. Number four, this is the last thing. During pregnancy, that pregnant season, all of this, your dreams, your plans, they can happen in spite of your thoughts. Now, the word tells us we are to walk by faith, not by sight. There is plenty of scripture to support how we're supposed to act, but how many of you know we are human? And there are times that we don't have it in us maybe to behave or react that way. Genesis 18, 12, so Sarah laughed to herself. Remember, she just overheard what was being said. And she laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything, is anything, is anything too hard for God? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied that she said it. She denied it. She said, I did not laugh. She was afraid, maybe afraid that if because she laughed, she had no faith, that promise would be taken away. Maybe because of her reaction. But let me tell you something. If God promises it, it's going to happen in spite of your thoughts, in spite maybe even of your unbelief. In some circumstances. Do you understand what I'm saying? I see Sarah in this. She, she, he said, but here's what I love. She said, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh, no, but you did laugh. <laughs> but she did. He called her out. And God may be calling you out right now. No, you did say this isn't for me. No, you did say my dream is gone. No, you did say that. But in spite of it, I'm going to work. In spite of it, I'm going to work. I'm going to have our worship team come up. I want you to go back to, uh, I, you pick any one of those songs today. They were amazing. I, I don't care. I'm going to have you guys stand to your feet. I want you to close your eyes. And I want the Holy Spirit just to begin to speak to your heart. That you understand that this whole day was orchestrated for you. From that first song they played all the way through to this message was orchestrated for you. And you're not even a mom. You just happen to be here to celebrate it. Mother's Day. Or maybe you are a mom. And God is speaking to that mother's heart today. God has a promise, and He has a purpose, and He has a plan. And today, He wants to renew that, even in your Death Valley time. So if you're here today and you go, man, I am in Death Valley. I've, I've laid it aside. It's been years. I've been hurt. This isn't what I had planned. I don't even see God in this. And this is you, heads are bowed. I want you to raise your hand because we're going to pray for you today if that is you. Okay. I've got several hands going up all over the building. And we're going to just end today in a time of worship and declaration. We're going to end in a time of believing and receiving today. Rededication if we need to. And the thing of it is, is God, you can talk to God just like you talk to your neighbor, your friend. You don't need me leading you in a prayer specifically for this. Establish that relationship with God today. As we sing this last song. And we're going we're gonna to let this be our declaration today. Thank you, Jesus. We just praise you for your word. We thank you for your promises. And we stand on them today believing that you have blessed us indeed. Lord, I pray that you would pour your presence out upon the people that are gathered here today, Father God. 
begin to speak to them again, Jesus, as they begin to cultivate and renew this hope, this dream, this seed that has been planted, as they begin to water it with your word, Father God, as they begin to water it with the renewing of their mind and believing in what you have said, Father God. And I pray that in that, Lord, we pray that you would move and give them echoes silent echoes throughout the days that their faith will stay strong father god i pray that you would just speak those promises over them father god i thank you for this day for our moms for our heritage lord and i pray that you would just continue to move throughout this week as we give you praise and we give you glory and all god's people said amen